Hello, hi. I am recording the second video in the educational series devoted to urban economics and city management. In this video, I am going to focus more specifically on a business, on a type of business which is almost exclusively, although not entirely, but almost exclusively focused in cities. And that business I'm going to show it in that window with the PowerPoint presentation is uh, that business is uh, the one of the so-called rate or real estate investment trusts. Uh, now a short uh, overview of let's say the social and economic background uh, of the way that real estate investment trusts, uh, trusts work and the way they are connected to urban economics and city management. So the first claim uh, to work around and to work through is that cities are complex technologies. So cities are essentially like big agglomerations of uh, technological structures. This is, by the way, how cities are being defined when scientists uh, observe the surface of the Earth from the orbit, uh, when they use satellite pictures to delineate the frontiers of cities. And that whole operation, the definition of urban land as opposed to rural land, is done precisely by observing during the day, so in daylight, the agglomeration of man-made structures. And during the night time, it is the observation of nighttime lights. And when the concentration of structures and the concentration of lights goes beyond and above a certain, a certain threshold, then a scientist can say this is a city, this is um, a piece of urban land. So cities are complex technologies and here comes another thing which I hope you already understand because this course of city management and urban economics is essentially located in the third year of undergraduate studies. So I hope, my dear students, that you all have some background already in microeconomics, macroeconomics, finance, management. Anyway, you probably know that technologies need investment, development and markets. Even the most perfect technology, a technology that could save humanity for any kind of trouble in the future, like a perfect source of energy, if it is supposed to be present in our lives, it needs investment, development and markets. So, question, how can we market city making technologies? And markets for technologies emerge uh, according to what a classic of the so-called Austrian School of Economics, Karl Menger, wrote about the economic good and the theory of economic goods. So markets for technologies emerge as we transform those technologies into economic goods, which means we transform them into controllable things and phenomena, control is important here, which have the ability to satisfy human needs and wants, satisfaction is the second component, and can be made into a tradable economic surplus. So can be made into something that can be traded without, uh, let's say, taking anything away from another person or without compromising the satisfaction of needs in the person who sells it. So cities can grow and evolve when we, the humans who live in the whereabouts, when we nail down the craft and the art of agglomerating in one place those city-making uh, uh, technologies, 
like construction, sanitation, transportation, energy supply, water supply, Wi-Fi, and so on. And when together with agglomerating them in one place, we master the craft of parceling them into like small packages which can be marketed to, indiv indiv to individual people. And here comes like the legal institutional part of that lecture. There are two types of contracts, rental and lease. Uh, to be more specific, rental and lease of real estate, because you can have rental and lease, for example, of cars or equ equipment. Uh, but in this case, we are talking about the rental and lease of real estate. And those two types of contracts are like the base for marketing the city making technologies. Just here a little distinction for you to understand. You know that in contracts which you might have to negotiate or sign, there are two concepts which seem very close uh, to each other, rental and lease. Essentially, technically, in the strictly legal terms, rental is the right to use a physical thing for the satisfaction of personal needs. So in this case, we use an apartment, a house, to satisfy personal needs of residents and a lease is the right to use a physical thing with the purpose of deriving economic profit thereof. So whenever you use a piece of real estate in order to do business, it is rather lease than rental. That's, let's say, the legal theory, although, for example, when you want to uh, have the right to use a physical place, for example, in a shopping mall, the kind of contract that the operator of the shopping mall will give you is, can be called rental, not necessarily lease. Anyway, excuse me, uh, I'm jumping a little bit. Okay, so the process which is like behind and before the emergence of rental and lease is the following. There is the acquisition of land. So some people acquire property, runs, uh, property rights to a certain piece of land. Then they do what is called promotion and develop uh, into real estate with technologies. So it simply means that they acquire the land and then they put together the technology of construction with the technology of sanitation, with the technology of electricity supply, with the technology of transportation and all that so land with technologies like superimposed on it, it creates what we call urban real estate. And here emerges a tradable economic surplus of rentals and leases in that real estate. And it can be claimed that that process of promotion and development of real estate is like a core activity, core recurrent activity in urban economics. Because historically, if you look at the history of cities, history of cities shows that every city usually had one or more founders, like founding fathers. Sometimes they were founding mothers, actually. Uh, and people with significant resources. In the past, they could be kings, princes, or whatever, warlords. They acquire control over a certain piece of land, and they decide that here it can pay off to create a city. So they need to invest in the development of infrastructural technology. One could ask, for example, in the past, let's say in the 11th century, what kind of infrastructural technology was needed. Well, you needed city walls uh, and you need some defense structure because the cities were at the time were structures which needed to defend themselves against invasions. For example, so the same people who found the city and invest in the development of infrastructural technologies seek to recoup their investment by renting and leasing functional, physically delineated parts of the real estate they created on the previously acquired land. And now, here, there is an interesting case. 
If you go, for example, to London in, in Britain and you want to buy a house, for example, or a big building, when you are signing the contract, you can see that what you are buying is not exactly property right. It is something that is called a lease, a long-term lease. Usually it is a 100-year lease. Why? Because a large part of land in London is still owned by wealthy aristocratic families from Britain. And what people buy and sell when they think they are buying and selling real estate, they really buy and sell uh, rights attached to that long-term lease. And another important point here, before we go into the presentation of two cases of rate, of two cases of real estate investment trusts, the process, that process of promotion and development of real estate is largely fueled by anticipation of future density in urban population. People who invest in the creation of infrastructural urban technologies try to anticipate how many humans per square kilometer will there be living like in 10 years from now. That's the basic ant anticipation that every real estate uh, promoter and developer does. Now, real estate investment trusts. Our business structure specifically adapted to the process of promotion and development of urban land. People put money together in something like a partnership, which is usually called a trust. And that rate, that trust, invests all that accumulated capital into like big pieces, big chunks of real estate. And the, uh, the rate, so the real estate investment trusts today play in the development of cities largely the same roles that uh, founding sovereigns or founding settlers would play in the medieval cities or in the colonies. Huh? These are those people who, like, who sort of first come to a place with an idea and money in the same time. And they create something urban there. And it is to understand that promotion and development of real estate is a rare skill set. There are very few people who are really skilled and gifted for that business. If you are, you can be like uh, at the top of the food chain in economic terms. And this is a business with significant scale effects. So the more real estate you have, the more f margin of freedom you have. Okay, now I will go to two case studies of two companies from the rate business. One located in the United States, it is called Urban Edge Properties, and another one located in Central Europe, uh, with most of the assets located in my home country, in Poland, and this one is called Atrium. I will show you their interim reports uh, for the first half of the year 2020. You will see more or less how it plays out, uh, how they sort of develop their business. I, I will try to show the basic mechanics of that raid business, which, as I said, is really vital for understanding the mechanics of urban economics in general. So I go, first of all, into the annual report of a society called Urban Edge. Let me quickly scroll to the front page of the document, just for you to know what is it. It is a document filed to the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. It is a quarterly report pursuant to Section 13 or 15D of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. It is a report for the quarterly period ended June the 30th, 2020. I go to that report, I will quickly scroll 
Here is their table of contents. In the table of contents, first of all, you have financial statements and then you have uh, management discussion. I will uh, unfold my exposition in a little bit of an inverted order. So I will uh, start with the management discussion just to show you the context of their business and then I will quickly jump into the financials. So there is like a cautionary statement here in the beginning. You can see it, the you can he, you can see here that certain statements contained herein constitute forward-looking statements, as such term is defined in section 27a, and so on and so on. Now I go to the overview of that business. Urban edge properties. Uh, further designed by the acronym UE Urban Edge or the company is a Maryland real estate investment trust that manages, develops, redevelops and acquires retail real estate primarily in the New York metropolitan area. Now there are two important things about that. First of all, the New York metropolitan area with what is happening there right now seems to be fact pretty much. And here comes like an uncomfortable detail about this specific business, our urban edge properties. Recent, well, in June, I have bought some of their stock in their, in their stock market. And I am losing a little bit of money on that. We will see how it unfolds later. And anyway, we return to it. You can see here the two like important uh, traits of a real estate investment trust. First of all, it is specialization. In this specific case, you can see specialization in retail real estate. Uh -huh. Retail means that they invest mostly in real estate, which is prone to be developed or to be managed as a shopping mall, essentially. This is what they do. And what they do with that retail real estate is that they manage, develop, redevelop and or acquire. So what those real estate investment trusts or this, what this specific investment trust can do are four different things. First of all, they can just acquire real or retail real estate. It means that in such a case that uh, that rate, that real estate investment trust is like a big trader of a retail real estate. They buy, for example, a shopping mall today with the anticipation that its market value will grow in the future without much additional development and they expect to sell it in the future with a substantial margin of profit. So that's the business of ac acquisition. Then there is the business of redevelopment, redevelops. Redevelopment means that those guys see a piece of retail real estate which is really underinvested. For example, the present owners do not have money to invest in like state of the art modern technologies like modern power technologies, sanitation, transportation, uh, uh, transportation, excuse me, and whatnot. So then redevelopment consists in acquiring that piece of real estate and investing in like uh, remodeling and renovating and modernizing the structure that is already there. Then there is development. Development means that we come to a place, we see a piece of land or a shopping mall and we don't really want and don't really intend to make it into a better version of what, of what it is now. We say we raise it all, we just demolish the structure that is there right now and we build it from the ground into something completely new. This is development. And finally, management. It is possible that such a RAID, Real Estate Investment Trust, 
uh, acquires the role of like an institutional manager of a big shopping mall. Uh, why should anyone appoint such a rate to be the manager? Because usually a manager should give like a financial guarantee or a reasonable financial guarantee that they will not completely destroy the business or the piece of real estate that they are supposed to manage. And uh, rates have money, so they can give financial guarantees to the primary owner of that retail real estate that they will manage that whole thing profitably because they put their own money as a financial guarantee. Okay, let's read further. Urban Edge Properties LP or UL, UELP or the Operating Partnership is a Delaware limited partnership formed to serve as UEs or Urban Edge Properties majority owned, owned partnership subsidiary and to own through affiliates all of the company's real estate properties and other assets. Unless the context otherwise requires references to we, us and our refer to urban edge properties and the UELP in and their, and their consolidated entities and subsidiaries. The operating partnerships capital includes general and common limited partnership interests in the operating partnership and as of June the 30th, 2020, Urban Edge owned approximately 96.1% of the outstanding common OP units with the, re uh, with the remaining limited OP units, operating partnership units held by members of management. Now, a few words, why that, uh, why this complex legal and business structure? Why having two structures, so urban edge properties on the one hand and urban edge properties uh, uh, LP on the other hand, uh, why having those two structures like linked together instead of having just, let's say, one partnership? In the business of rate of real estate investment trust, it is really important between or, or to distinguish between passive investment and active investment. That business seems to be working really well only when there is like a clear captain on the bridge. So when there is a small team of relatively big investors who put big money in the game and who can trace like a good strategy to go ahead. Why is it also important to be able to collect small parcels of capital from small investors who want to invest in like small participations in that whole business? Whence the need for two different structures? Uh, a limited partnership, because LP is what it is, it is limited partnership. So it is like it is like that inner circle of big investors who steer the whole thing. And there is the urban edge of properties, which is the business structure that gives the capacity to collect small pieces of capital for uh, from small investors. That's the, the essential reason uh, for those two business structure to exist back to back in uh, the same business. Okay, now I will jump back in that report to their financials, just to have the idea how that business works uh, on the financial side. So please quick, quick scroll to the beginning of the report. Yes, first of all, their consolidated balance sheets. So we can have an idea of how much capital they have in the business. I think it is pretty much fitting into the screen. Yes, it is fitting into the screen. So you can see that their total assets here, I will just highlight it just in case. The total assets by the end of June 2020 were of 3 billions 
125 million, 107 thousands of dollars. All that data is in thousands, except share and per share amounts. And once again, a reminder which I give frequently when I give those lectures and make those videos with financials. In the Anglo-Saxon financial notation in that specific format, the coma is not the decimal point. Once again, the coma is not the decimal point. The coma is a separator of orders of magnitude. It separates thousands from millions and millions from billions. Okay, that's the function of, of the coma in that notation. So they have those assets which are like 3.12 billions of dollars or were at that time uh, at this amount on uh, by the end of June 2020 and by the end of December 2019 so 6 months earlier it was 2.84 billions of dollars so we have a growth in the value of assets we can say that there is accumulation of capital and let's see now what is exactly that the business model based on so what are the assets that this specific business model is based on so land is like half a billion dollars there is not much growth in land really then there are buildings and improvements to land and to buildings. And here you can see that this is by far the biggest item in that whole active side of the balance sheet. You can see that it is 2.3 billions of dollars. So it makes the majority of the assets of that company. So here we nail down one component of that business model. We invest in land, yes, but we invest much more in, uh, in improvements and buildings, so in those technologies. By the way, you remember, a building is an agglomeration of technologies as well. Huh? Even a single brick in the wall is a piece of technology that someone used and put there. Okay, the second most uh, important number in the balance sheet is there. Cash and cash equivalents. Cash and cash equivalents. So, and it makes a little bit more than 615 millions of dollars by the end of June this year. So the business on the active side on, of the balance sheet seems to be based on really on city making and real estate making technologies and on a reserve of cash. Why that large reserve of cash? What I could see like across the board in many companies is that when technologies change quickly, companies want to hold more and more cash in their balance sheets. I guess that it is just because as the technological change goes faster and faster, each individual business can face those situations when they have to remodel their strategy like that very quickly. And when you have to act quickly, cash is king, really. I mean, borrowing money from a bank is nice, but when you really quickly need money, it's better, it, it, it better be your own money, so the cash that you already hold in your balance sheet. So now let's have a stroll and a look on the passive side of their balance sheet, just to see what their business model consists in. So we have liabilities and equity. We remember that we have the total sum of liabilities and equity, the same as the total sum of assets, which by the end of June was 3.12 billions of dollars. Now in that total, there are two like biggest aggregates 
that stick out of, of the crowd, which finance the great majority. First of all, you have that thing, mortgages payable, here. Just to remind you or to explain you, I, I hope that you generally know the concept of mortgage. Uh, mortgage is a special type of bank loan, a special type of borrowing. When I borrow money from a bank and I give a, real, a piece of real estate as a financial guarantee, as a financial backup for that loan, I can have a significantly lower interest rate on that loan as compared to an ordinary business loan. And when I say significantly lower, it means that, for example, right now in Poland, the mortgage is uh, priced around like 3.7, 3.8% a year, whilst the basic business loan would be around 7% a year. So it pays. And visibly, the business scheme that this specific company, Urban Edge, practices is to borrow money from banks to buy real estate, to invest in real estate, and they guarantee those loans with a, a subsidiary claim on the real estate they buy. That's the concept of mortgage. So you can see that the biggest part of the balance sheet on the passive side are those mortgages payable. I can even try to make a drawing around them. Okay, maybe I can, just to make it more visible, I can underline them, yes? So, mortgages are the first big component. Now, the second biggest item on that passive side of the balance sheet is that, that figure, 984933. And that corresponds to additional paid-in capital, so to a component of equity on the passive side of the balance sheet. Underline it. Uh, just to explain to those of you who don't know the concept of additional paid-in capital, you can practice a business strategy when at the moment of founding and starting a business you put just a little bit of money into the equity of the business and then as those projects and prospects unfold then you can add money by, by small steps. It is a step by step investment in the equity of the business and that step-by-step -step investment in equity done after the incorporation of the business is precisely additional paid-in capital. In the same time, you can see that they don't accumulate much earnings in their, on the passive side of, of, of their balance sheet. It looks like they pay like substantial dividends to their shareholders. And as we talked about div dividends, in a moment we'll go to the income statement. Now, just to put together the small pieces of the business model as seen through the lens of the balance sheet. So those guys borrow money from banks on the basis of a general construct of mortgage. So they see a piece of real estate they make a preliminary deal with the bank. Look, you lend us money that will facilitate us the acquisition of that real estate and we, and we give you a subsidiary conditional claim of that real estate to back up the loan. Deal done, deal done. And so that's the first source of financing and the second source of financing, slightly less important, is that step-by-step -step additional paid-in capital so that equity being built up as business prospects unfold and that stuff goes into mostly buildings and improvements so into technology 
and secondarily into building a reserve of cash just in case to have that like that quick reaction time and here is their statement of income you can uh, we, uh, we can see how profitable they are and what are and what is their scale of operations so six months ended june 30th uh, revenue so total revenue which is mostly made of rental you can see what did i tell you in the beginning of that pre presentation that rental and lease is like the primary uh, marketable good or the form of marketable good as regards city making technologies so total revenue made mostly of, of rental in the first half of this year was 166 million nine hundred and seventy nine thousands of dollars and it was significantly smaller, 34%, uh, I mean, excuse me, 17% smaller than in the first half of 2019. Here we can see the impact of COVID-19 on the business of real estate. Those rents had to be reduced significantly. Now we go all the way down to the uh, to their profit and the net income they make and you can see that for those six months ended June 30th they managed to make like a nice income a nice net income after tax 83.8 millions of dollars which is significantly more than last year so if they had less revenue but bigger profit obviously they could cut out uh, some costs and this is what they did. Uh, there is a type of cost which, however, they didn't cut. They didn't cut general and administrative. This one has grown, as a matter of fact, by like six millions of dollars. What they reduced are the costs of property operating and the impairment loss. Huh? So I think that just reading between the lines that this bigger net income for the first half of this year is generated slightly by, let's say, by some accounting tricks rather than by economic reality. Hmm? Anyway, they seem to be making money. Uh, and one important thing, if you compare that revenue would it be the revenue for the first half of this year or the first half of the last year? So we are roughly speaking talking about a revenue in the $400 million a year. It is like 11% or 12%, just let me calculate it quickly, uh, 400 divided by uh, 3, 1, 2... Is like uh, so the revenue is like 13 percent of the uh, of the capital invested in that whole business so the rotation of assets and the rotation of capital is quite slow uh, and we could say that there is but the rotation of equity which is just above 1 billion is quite satisfactory huh? uh, and we can quickly calculate the return on equity in the business so if we provisionally assume that the net income for the whole year 2020 could be like two times uh, the net income for uh, the first half we do the following operation Let me put that rectangle here, make it slightly flatter and to do the following calculation. So 2 times 83, 83 divided by 3 point two. Okay, that. And that would give us 
uh, excuse me now, I wanted to return to calculate the return on equity and their equity with A1027. So that return on equity would be 2 times 83.83, which makes 167.66 divided by 1027, and it is 16.3%, quite nice. It means that the return on equity in this specific business comes to you after like, uh, uh, let's say, divided by one, some seven years, okay? So it is like seven year cycle of return on equity. And if we assume that the equity is invested mostly in buildings and improvements in real estate, it is relatively safe, okay? Good. So we are slowly coming to the end of this video. In some of the next ones, I hope to present you more cases. Uh, for example, the case of Atrium. Now I will give you just a glimpse uh, of that second company I want to work with. Uh, and because it is located in my home country, mostly in Poland. So here is a look at the half annual report of that Atrium company. I go to that report and I will give you a, sh click, a quick glimpse of what they do. Hmm. Uh, they invest mostly in shopping malls, just as uh, it is the case of Urban Edge. And here is an idea of how much they own. Their standing investment portfolio is, is 2.5 billion of euro. Uh, which would give us 2.5 which would give us like 2.9 billions of dollars so their portfolio is like similar to uh, to urban edge that seems to be like the comfortable scale of operations for those companies most of it is located in Poland. You can see it here, 1.6 billion of, of euro invested in Poland, the rest in the Czech Republic. Ninety five point four percent occupancy of their places. Tenant sales 8% up in as compared to January and February and we will see uh, what they can do in the second half of the year. Uh, and anyway, by that quick comparison between those two cases, you can see already one more component of the business model and I like very much to focus on business models so I like very much to find those common denominators between different between different individual businesses in the same industry there is a common component that uh, first of all it that real estate investment trust so generalizing the process of accumulating city making technologies seems to be focused or to have been focused so far very largely on retail real estate. So during those years uh, that have passed like during maybe the last 10 years the accumulation of city making technologies seems to be very largely focused on retail spaces. The question is, what will be the next step, for example, in the context of the pandemic? You know that uh, in, uh, due to those uh, restrictions and due to common sense behavior in people, uh, there is much less traffic in shopping malls, so much less turn uh, turnover in the shopping malls. And that business is likely to be maybe on the decline. Maybe there will be need to convert those shopping malls, those retail spaces into something else. What? We will see. Hmm? And the second component of the business model is that scale of operations. 
being around three billions of dollars in terms of capital invested seems to be like that workable scale at least at the moment okay that would be all in the video as usually visit my scientific blog as at discoversocialsciences.com just as you can see in that inscription below the window with me in the video and well have fun with science and have fun with life <laughs>